All right, so for the past couple weeks, we've been going over some of the more basic doctrines, and it's important to be doing this on a regular basis in church that, that people, you know, hopefully we'll be having new believers coming on a regular basis and, and everyone's at a different level spiritually. But even for those of you that are, that are well versed and you, you're pretty solid on, on the basic doctrines of the Bible, we need to be reconfirming these things on a regular basis. It could be, you know, when you're, when you're only looking for new things out of the Bible, it could actually get you imbalanced. And you can start to forget the the basic principles and the fundamentals and the foundational truths that that you once knew and kind of get steered off in the wrong direction when it comes to doctrine. So we're going to be continuing on with with just going over some of the basics. And this morning I'm going to be teaching on baptism, on water baptism. Now at the end of Matthew 28, there it's, we, we see what's known as the, the Great Commission here in the last few verses. We're going to see Jesus Christ basically commanding His disciples to do a few things. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he's saying, look, I, I've got the power, so I'm telling you to do something now. You need to listen. Verse 19, Go ye therefore... And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And well, I start off here just by saying that, you know, baptism is a command. It's a commandment from Jesus Christ himself, you know, commanding his disciples to go forth and baptize people. And what we believe here, turn if you would to Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, is that once you are saved, salvation is a free gift. All you got to do to be saved is put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very simple, very easy. Jesus did all the hard work for you. God loves you so much that, that He made it easier than you could possibly imagine as far as you know, not having to do any type of work in order to earn your way into heaven. He says, nope, I bought it, I paid for it, it's for you, it's free, just receive it. Just put your faith in my Son. Just put your faith on Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We believe that. And after a person does that, we're commanded to be baptized. Now, there's many people out there that believe that baptism is actually some a, a, a part or an additional step to your salvation. And that's a completely false doctrine. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but I need, since I'm touching on baptism, we need to go over this so that there's clarity in why we get baptized, the importance of being baptized, and what baptism is not. Baptism is a command. It's something we ought to do. If you are saved this morning and you have not been baptized, you need to get baptized. And if that's the case for any of you, let me know. We've got a a tub that we can fill up with water and you can be baptized today. And we'll make sure we get this taken care of. And that's why I just want to start off by showing you, hey, Jesus was commanding his disciples to go and baptize people. If it wasn't important to be baptized, then Jesus wouldn't command his disciples saying, go and baptize In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. But what we believe in here is a believer's baptism. That's why I said if you're you're already saved, you need to be baptized. And actually, keep your finger in Mark 16 and turn, if you would, to to Acts chapter 8. Keep your finger in Mark 16. Just go forward a little bit more to Acts chapter 8. And in Acts chapter 8, is the, is, it's not the only place this is taught, but it's the most clear place that this is taught, that a believer needs to be baptized and that you actually should not be baptized until after you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I, I was baptized as a baby, as a child. I grew up in a Presbyterian church, which is just a Reformed Catholic church. The Catholic church likes to sprinkle babies, and they call that baptism. They say you need to be baptized, and they, and they say you know, that, that the babies need to be baptized, or else if they die, they're going to go to purgatory or hell or what, you know, something like that. And, and that's, a, that's a weird, wicked doctrine that God is going to send some baby to hell because they didn't get water sprinkled on their forehead or whatever. I mean, that's, that's bizarre. 
But there's a lot of people that hold to that, and there's a lot of Protestant churches that came out of the Catholic Church that still retain a lot of the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Presbyterian is one of them. That's why I was sprinkled as a baby. Now, they don't take that doctrine to the extreme that the Catholic Church does, but they still practice and do a lot of the same traditions. So when I got saved when I was 20 years old, I couldn't just say, oh, well, I've already been baptized. Right? Because I was baptized as an infant. Well, that baptism meant nothing. And here's why. Look at Acts chapter 8. We're going to see the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, there's a man, this eunuch, he's, he's driving in his chariot. And this, the, the Holy Spirit is, is basically telling Philip to go and speak unto this man. Hey, go up to that chariot and talk to that guy. So he goes up to the chariot and he preaches unto him Jesus. Look at verse number 35. The Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began, excuse me, began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Because just prior to that, he asked him, Hey, do you understand what you're reading? Because he's reading the Bible. And the guy's like, How can I except some man Chicago? He's like, I don't know what I'm reading. I don't know what this means. What is this talking about here? He didn't understand. So Philip's going to explain it to him. And it's actually perfect because the verse that he was looking at was, had everything to do with salvation. So he preaches unto him Jesus, verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And all that means is he's saying, Well, why can't I be baptized? He's preaching. So get the story. He's in the chariot. Philip's with him. He's preaching Jesus unto him. And as they're driving along, he says, Hey, look, there's some water right here. Why can't I be baptized? Now, at this point, Philip doesn't even know if this guy's saved yet. Because he is pre- he's trying to get him saved. He's preaching the gospel of Christ. And he says, oh, okay, oh, you want to be baptized? Well, here's what's stopping you. Here's what's preventing you from being baptized. Verse 37, he answers him. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's saying you cannot be baptized unless you are a believer. That is the restriction. That is the requirement. That is what holds a person back. So when you're an infant, when you're a child, when you're a baby, you don't know what you believe. You don't believe anything. You don't, you're not putting your faith on Jesus Christ as a newborn. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work like that. So and if someone else gets you wet and dunks you under water or sprinkles water in your head, you got wet. But according to Scripture, according to the Bible, according to God, it's not a baptism. And that's why you need to believe first and then get baptized. And notice in verse 38, so he, after he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that was good enough for Philip. He says, okay. Verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. Very simple. You see, a lot, of, a lot of churches, a lot of people want to make this more difficult and say, oh, well, you've got to take our class and you've got to go through this whole baptism class. It's going to take you a month or a few months. You have to go every week and we'll teach you. you got to really make sure you understand all of this stuff before we can baptize you. Is that what Philip did? No. He said, hey, oh, you want to be baptized? All right, well, you've got to believe. Oh, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You believe that with all of your heart? All right, let's baptize you. Amen. Right here in the road. You have to be a believer in order to be baptized. It's not infant baptism. Also, baptism is not for salvation. He was saved the moment he believed on Jesus Christ. When that man, that eunuch, put his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, he confessed with his mouth, Jesus Christ. And Philip said, great, let's baptize you. I had you turn to Mark 16. The reason why I had you turn to Mark 16 is because this is one of the verses, one of the key verses that people who want to tell you you have to be baptized in order to be saved will turn to. So they have a few others. I've gone through sermons in the past just completely debunking this, but I just want to cover the most popular one just so that you're not just have no idea what to say when people approach you with this. And so I could just teach you, get some understanding. If you haven't heard this before or seen this before, what this is talking about, Mark chapter 16, it's actually... See, when people teach a false doctrine, sometimes it could be easy when they're already spinning the way they want you to look at it to, to, to get confused about it. But when you look at it 
and just look at the verse for what it says and understand grammar and understand even just logic. And I'm going I'm to show you this in a second, that this is not teaching what they say it teaches. Uh, Mark 16, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So they say, see, look, it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So you see, see, right there it says, you have to be baptized to be saved. But there's a flaw in that thinking. First of all, there are hundreds of verses in the Bible that never mention baptism at all in order to be saved. I mean, the, the most clear is in Acts 16, right? Where the, the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Very clear. And there's, there's a whole mountain. I mean, I could rattle off, literally take 10 minutes just rattling off verse after verse after verse after verse that says, Whosoever believeth, whosoever believeth, shall be eternal life, everlasting life. It's all based on believing. And then they come to this one verse where it's stated, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. There's two things to notice here. First, look at the latter part. It says, But he that believeth not shall be damned. Where's baptism? Where does it say, But he that believeth and is not baptized shall be damned? Or, He that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. Because the baptism isn't a part of your salvation or damnation. The statement is completely true. He that believes, who here, just a show of hand, who here believes and is baptized? Well, according to this verse, you're saved. Because he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But was a baptism necessary for your salvation? No. But he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's true. It's it you, you could you could use the same wording and insert anything else there with the baptism and it's still true. He that believeth and stands on one foot shall be saved. Why? Why? Because he that believeth is saved. Whosoever believeth shall have everlasting life. That's why. So anything else you add to that, it doesn't, it doesn't make it an extra requirement. It's just, it's just a clear statement. And um, obviously Jesus wants people to be baptized, but he's not saying that that is a requirement to be saved. And it would contradict scores of other verses in the Bible. So don't let people confuse you with, this, uh, you know, with a verse like this. Now, one other thing I want to point out, just kind of along the same note here. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Another reason why baptism doesn't save, I'm going to read for you from John chapter 4. You're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. John chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. And then the story continues on there. And that's a parenthetical statement. I I like paying extra attention to the parenthetical statements in the Bible. Because it's giving you extra information about what was just stated. And And it's making a very clear point here for a good reason. Because why would we need to know that Jesus himself didn't baptize? Why is that critical? Why is that important? Because baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't matter who is doing the baptism necessarily. You know, that, that's a whole nother, I'm not even going to get into that this morning on, on this topic on who is allowed to baptize. But we see here that I think Jesus didn't baptize people on purpose so that people wouldn't think that there's something extra special about the baptism that Jesus did on people versus his disciples doing. Because this is a practice that's going to continue after Jesus Christ left. And I don't think he wanted people um, getting too focused on the fact, oh, well, Jesus Christ personally baptized me over one of his disciples who are doing the baptism. And so it says here, look, there's a lot of people being baptized. So Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Remember, John was John the Baptist. He was the first one out there doing all these baptisms. And he baptized a lot of people. He drew a lot of attention. A lot of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and just people from all around the area were, were going unto John and hearing him preach and, and seeing what was going on and seeing all these people being baptized in the river. And, and 
they were you know, asking him all these questions. And he made a big stir. He had a great ministry. But when Jesus came on the scene, see, John the Baptist was just preparing the way for Jesus. And after he prepared the way for Jesus, Jesus came on the scene. And even more people, a greater number of people were being baptized. And it was all at the direction of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Because he was ultimately the one responsible. He was the one preaching. He was the one, you know, basically ordering this stuff to be done. But physically, he wasn't the one dunking people under the water. That's why it says that though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. So we don't want to put too much of an emphasis. And this is also why I believe personally that after a person gets saved, if you get baptized, if you get dunked underwater... The person doing it doesn't matter as much as just the fact that you went and got baptized. That you showed that you are going to obey God and the command to get baptized. A lot of people will struggle and have problems with, oh, well, you know, I got baptized by this person. And it turns out that maybe they weren't saved or this person, you know, this person specifically did my baptism. And then they turned out to be a false prophet later on and you had no idea. And people get concerned about, well, is that baptism valid? And I would say, yeah, I believe it was. I mean, we don't know. It doesn't tell us specifically here, but I would guess that Judas was probably baptizing people. He was one of the 12 disciples in Jesus' ministry. Now, if you were to have gotten baptized by Judas, look, at the time, he was saying everything, right? At the time, he was part of Jesus' ministry. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved. If you were to happen to get baptized by someone who later on you find out, oh man, that guy wasn't even saved. I don't think that affects your baptism in God's eyes. I think he sees that, look, you believe, you got baptized, you showed your faith publicly by getting baptized, and that's acceptable. And that's what's ultimately important. That's why it's not that important that Jesus was doing the baptism himself and his disciples were doing it. Now... If you have a problem with that, if you know people get concerned or, or it really bothers you, there's also no harm in getting baptized again. If that's something that's a real sticking point with you and you're not sure about it, go ahead and get baptized again. That's not, it's not, um, again, because it's, it's, it's important, it's a command, but it's not something that's, that's so important that it like impacts your salvation. Now, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I just want to point this out. This is, this is my favorite place. When, when you run into a Pentecostal or somebody who wants to tell you that no, you know, or a Catholic or anybody who wants to tell you, well, no, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I think, provides the most clear evidence that this is not our, you know, the, the, the goal of baptism is to get people saved at all. Look at, we're going to start reading here in verse number 12. The Bible says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now he's pointing this out because there's, there's, there's grown to be a division among people where they're, they're following a person more than just God's word. And, and he's trying to explain you don't need these factions of, well, I'm this, this person, this preacher's follower, and I'm this preacher's follower, and be divided as if one, you know, comparing one over another or whatever. And this comes in perfectly with baptism. You know, who cares who is the one who baptized you? Because he's saying, look, were you baptized in the name of Paul? It's like, like, were I baptizing you in the name of Paul? You know, I don't, I don't baptize people in the name of David, right? I, I don't baptize people in my own name. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about God. It's, you know, that's what it's about. It's about baptizing people uh, that way. And he's saying in verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. But Christmas and guys, now, first of all, if you needed baptism to be saved, why would he say, I thank God that I didn't baptize you? Except for a couple people. The reason why I saying I thank God that I didn't baptize you is because of all these people splitting off and saying, well, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. He didn't want to create even more division. He doesn't want people putting more stock in the fact that he baptized them as opposed to somebody else. Because Apostle Paul was doing a great work. I mean, he was used mightily. Look at all the epistles of Paul. He was used 
He was one of the greatest Christians to ever live, the Apostle Paul. And people held him in high regard. So, in his mind, he's looking at this and saying, you know what, I'm just thankful that I didn't do a lot of the baptisms. Because then that would be even more reason for people to get, to be stumbling over things that don't really matter. Like who it is that baptizes you. And he didn't want people to then start thinking that, oh, Paul's getting this big following after him. Now, after Jesus is gone and, and leading people after him. So I don't want people saying I'm baptizing in my own name and, and drawing people after me because it's not about him. It's about Jesus. Verse 15, it continues on, though. It gets even more clear. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. So I don't want you even saying that. I don't want anyone to have that thought. Verse 16, And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize. But I thought baptism was required for salvation. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is the power of God, not baptism. The preaching of the cross is what gets a person saved. The gospel is what gets a person saved, not baptism. That's why he says, look, Christ didn't send me to go baptize a bunch of people. He sent me to preach the gospel to a bunch of people. Paul was an evangelist. He went around preaching the gospel and getting people saved. Now look, it was still a command for people to be baptized after they preached the God, after they got saved, but Paul wasn't about that. Paul was about making sure he could get as many people saved as possible. Now he did end up baptizing a few people, and he lists off specifically a few people he remembers baptizing. But he's saying that wasn't really the job that I was out to do. He was out to get people saved, because getting saved has nothing to do with being baptized. And this is an extremely clear passage. You say, because you know, people get caught up and all you know, when, when you start adding different things to salvation, it's like, well, when what when did baptism become a requirement? Because people weren't even being baptized in the Old Testament. And and that's where the argument really falls apart. And look, I'm telling you this to help educate you so that you know how to deal with people that have that are hung up on an issue like this. Because when you go out soul winning, you want that person to be saved, right? That's why you're there. And if they're hung up on something where they believe, well, no, no, you have to be baptized, we ought to be able to show them Scripture as to why that's wrong, as to why that's incorrect, and why they need to change what they believe and get saved and stop trusting in their works and stop trusting in baptism and only believe on Jesus Christ. So make a note, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when someone has that issue, bring them here, show them this. Be able to have an answer for Mark 16. Even Jesus got baptized. And it definitely was not to receive salvation. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter number 3. If the whole purpose of baptism is to be saved, then why did Jesus get baptized? He got baptized because it didn't have to do with salvation. There's another point to it where he gets to that at the end of the sermon. Matthew chapter number 3, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So here we have the story. Jesus comes to John, and he says, you know, basically, hey, I want you to baptize me. And John's like, I need to be baptized of you. What are you thinking coming to me, right? Like, I I don't don't have any authority over you, because John knew that he was the Son of God. He knew he was the Christ. He's like, how can the world can I baptize you? You're the one that you know. You're the one that brings everything. You're the teacher. You're the rabbi. You're the master. You know, how can I baptize you? But he said, no, no, no. Just, just allow it to happen. Just suffer it to be so. Now, this has to happen. I need to be baptized, and you're the one to do it. So, he basically had him do it. And then I want to draw a note here to verse number sixteen. 
Because says in Jesus, when he was baptized, he was baptized, it says he went up straightway out of the water. Now, it says he went up out of the water, he was in the water. When we read this story in Acts chapter 8, he said, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? They too went into the water. The reason why I'm making a note of this is because baptism, when we say the word baptism, and what we mean by that, and the way that we practice baptism is by immersion. You are completely immersed in the water. Now, I'm not big on going back to the Greek and the Hebrew to understand the Bible any better. You could completely understand these concepts without having any knowledge of any other languages. But baptism itself, the word literally means immersion. Immerse, to immerse or being immersed in water, you know, in anything. This is what the baptism is. Oh, baptism is being immersed. And um, this is one of the big distinctions between the Greek Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church when they split. It was over this issue of what baptism even is, where the, the, the Roman Catholic Church sprinkles and the Greek Orthodox dunks. And the reason why is because the Greeks understand the Greek language. They understand what Greek, the, the word baptism or baptizo uh, means immersion. That is just literally just what it means. And that's no, you know, you don't need to know that to, to understand that that's how it was practiced. And we can see that straight from scripture that people were being dunked under the water because they were going, why would you have to go all the way into the water if all you had to do is sprinkle a few drops on somebody? You could be carrying water around with you to do that. You don't need to say, oh wow, here's a big um, area of water. Actually turn if you would to John chapter 3. Some people think that you could sprinkle. Some people think you could pour, just pour a little bit of water from a pitcher and call that um, baptism, but it simply is not baptism. Baptism is being completely immersed in water. John chapter 3 and verse number 22. Verse number 22, the Bible reads, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. Now, why would he need to have much water if baptism is only by sprinkling or only by pouring? You don't need much water for that. You just need a little bit of water. Well, the reason why he was baptizing here is because you need much water in order for someone to go completely underwater and come back up again. Now, you're in John chapter 3. Just go back a couple pages. John chapter 1. I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time now because I've preached sermons on baptism in the past and these are a lot of real basic things. But one of the things that people get caught up with, especially again in, in Pentecostal circles, is the baptism of the Holy Ghost versus the baptism just that you receive after you get saved with water. And I think there's confusion about that. And, I, and honestly, I don't know if this is even really taught that much by, by many people. So I wanted to cover this topic this morning. And we're going to go more in depth into this than in anything else. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse number 26. The Bible says, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost." So here we see a clear distinction in John being told, look, you're going to baptize with water. You're going to baptize people. You're going to dunk them underwater. They're going to be immersed with water. But there's going to be one coming, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. Now, when Jesus' disciples were baptizing people, 
They were baptizing people with water. But Jesus was baptizing with the Holy Ghost. And we're going to understand what that means here. We're going to look at some more scriptures. Look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Right before the book of John. The book of Luke. Luke chapter 3. It's just before John. We see another reference to Jesus baptizing people with the Holy Ghost. Luke 3.16, the Bible says, John answered, saying unto them, All, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So there's another reference to Jesus baptizing people with the Holy Ghost. Now, flip back, if you would, to John, or flip forward to John chapter 20. I just want to, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of homework here, and, and I want to make sure this is really clear what being baptized with the Holy Ghost is and what it is not. John baptized with water. We baptized with water. Jesus baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay? John chapter 20. I want you to understand this, that receiving the Holy Spirit when you get saved, because we believe that once a person gets saved, you, re, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God. That, that, that the Holy Ghost resides within you after you get saved. Okay? After a person believes on Jesus Christ. This event, the first time that this happened, because this is a new thing for New Testament believers to receive that indwelling. People in the Old Testament did not receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But in John chapter 20, we're going to start reading in verse 18. This is the same, these events are taking place the very same day that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. We're going to see the first time that people received the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. In John chapter 20. Because this is not the same as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. John 20 verse number 18. The Bible reads. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And that he had spoken these things unto her. Remember Mary Magdalene went to the grave that morning. And, and Jesus spake with her right there. So that same day she's going and telling the other disciples what happened. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening. Being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of and said and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is when they received the Holy Ghost indwelling them. Because it was, it, was, it was immediately after his resurrection. Jesus Christ had to die on the cross, be dead, buried for three days and three nights, and rise again from the dead and perform all of that in order for us to receive the Comforter, in order for us to receive the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. So he gives the Holy Ghost by breathing on them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then verse 23 says, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now flip back, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I just want to prove this to you. It's very clear when you look, when you compare all the scriptures. When you want to understand what something means, you have to go and try to find all the, the usages and, and be paying very close attention to what the Bible is actually saying. We saw two times the mention of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Ghost. In John 20, he didn't say anything about baptism at all. He just said, receive you the Holy Ghost. He didn't say you're, gonna, you're, you're being immersed with the Holy Ghost. You're receiving it. And every believer today receives the Holy Ghost inside of them. This is a different event than, than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're going to see what, um, look what Jesus told them in Luke. 
These events in Luke 24 happen after that very first day of the resurrection when they received the Holy Ghost that we just read. Luke 24, we're going to start reading in verse number 45. Because this is when Jesus you know, met, some, met some of the disciples in the way, and he walked with them and, and kind of explained all these things. And you know, remember they said, you know, well, are you just a stranger? And now you heard all these things that are going on. And this is after he'd already appeared to Mary. This is after he already appeared to the other disciples. He's appearing unto people um, and continuing to appear unto people. This is after the fact. So verse, this is after he gave them the Holy Ghost, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Verse number 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in the name of all nations, excuse me, and should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things and behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So now he's telling them, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait here in Jerusalem. You're going to wait because you're going to be endued with power from on high. God's going to give you his power, but not yet. So wait here in Jerusalem. It hasn't happened yet. This event hasn't happened. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. This statement that he promises them here, the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts chapter 1. This promise is brought up again. It's mentioned here in Acts chapter 1. And this is referring to the baptism of the Holy Ghost that Jesus was talking about. And that John was talking about. Acts chapter 1, verse number 3. The Bible says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Same exact mention we just read in Luke 24. Wait for the promise. You're waiting in Jerusalem for the promise. Verse number 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So soon. It's still coming. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is well after the events of John 20 when he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I know. Look, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but I really want to make sure this is clear. I really want to make sure this concept is clear because there's a lot of confusion and people try to confuse you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and water baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. These are three different things, completely separate things. The indwelling of the Holy Ghost when you get saved. Water baptism is what happens after you get saved when you decide to just submit yourself to the command of Jesus Christ and get baptized. When that happens, you don't necessarily get a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's just water baptism. I'm going to prove that to you in a minute also. That the two aren't linked together in, you know, you, that you can't separate the two. Because again, there's a lot of people who teach you, oh no, once you get baptized, then you get all these gifts of the Holy Ghost and all this other stuff. That's not true. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a completely separate thing. And that doesn't come upon all believers. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'll prove that to you. So he says here, he says, wait here. Now look, they were already believers. They had not been baptized with the Holy Ghost yet. Verse number six. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Not within you, is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, every time you see the Holy Ghost being mentioned, 
in Scripture, in the Old Testament or New Testament, when the Holy Ghost comes upon someone, it's always characterized by people having power of God, by people preaching boldly, by people being able to do things through God's power, like healing people or doing you know, miraculous things. That is when God's Holy Ghost comes upon somebody. That is not new to the New Testament. That is in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. In fact, one person who it is said of that the Holy Ghost came upon them more often than anyone else was Samson. God's Spirit came upon Samson, and that's when he was able to do all those those miraculous events of like you know carry you know ripping up the gates to the city and walking out with them over his head and and doing these 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 extremely mighty acts, physically speaking. He didn't have the muscles to do that. He had the power of God to be able to do that because it was supernatural things that he was able to do. No man under their own strength could do those things. And when God's, when the Holy Ghost comes upon people, they're filled with boldness. They're, they're filled with the Spirit of God. They preach the Word of God and they're often able to do things that they normally wouldn't be able to do physically. So in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see the baptism of the Holy Ghost and what happened when the disciples were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Verse number 1 of Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So look, this is a baptism because they're completely immersed. It fills the whole house round about where they are. It's a full immersion of the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Acts chapter 2 continues on and explains that there were people from all under, under the nation, from all the various nations that spoke all different languages. And when it says that they spake with other tongues, they spake with languages, with real languages that people were able to understand from the land that they were born in. And they were traveling here the day of Pentecost to come and worship the Lord from all over the place. And they were gathered together in one place and God used this event in order for them to preach the gospel to people. And to tell them the good news and even you know, the disciples didn't have knowledge of these languages. But the Holy Ghost, God's power came upon them to be able to speak in those languages. It was, it's as if I would be able to speak Chinese unto you right now. I have no idea. I don't know any words in Chinese. Not one. But if I was able to just open up my mouth and start speaking Chinese to you. That's what was happening here. And it lists off all the languages. In Acts chapter 2. But we're not going to go through that uh, just for sake of time. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 8. But that's what happened. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost completely enveloped and came around them. And gave them these gifts and gave them this power from the Lord. This is, this is way after their salvation. This is way after their, their water baptism that they received this baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's a completely separate thing. Acts chapter 8. We're going to have another example here. Of the Holy Ghost being separate. The baptism of the Holy Ghost being very separate from water baptism. Acts chapter 8. Look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So Philip, again, is preaching the gospel, just like he did later in this chapter with the, uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch. So he's preaching Jesus Christ. People believe. Then they're baptized, both men and women. Verse number 13. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized... He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. These people believed. 
They were saved. They had their water baptism, but they had not received the power of the immersion of the Holy Ghost to be able to do the things under the power of the Holy Ghost, like heal people, speak with a language you don't know, do these great works that God had wanted them to do and to perform at this time. Verse 16, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, we mentioned that I brought this up like one or two weeks ago when I, when I preached on the laying on of hands, because that was another basic doctrine that we went over. And we see here, look, just because you're saved, just because you get baptized, doesn't mean you're automatically going to have these these types of gifts and be immersed with the Holy Ghost. It's a separate event. Now, Jesus is able to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. I believe He's still able to do that even today. But it's, it's not an automatic thing that you just receive because you're saved. So don't get, don't get deceived about that. Don't be lied to about that. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 10, just a couple pages forward. Acts chapter 10. We're going to see another example of this. When Peter is sent to preach to Cornelius... He was a centurion of the band of, a, of an Italian band. So this is he was he was a Gentile, he was someone that the Jews had no dealings with at that time. And God was trying to reveal to Peter and to the Jews, look, you need to be preaching the gospel to everybody. This isn't just for the Jews, this is for the whole world. You need to be able to go and and forget your customs of not sitting down and eating with someone who's not a Jew and go and get over yourself and humble yourself and go and, and sit and meet with all different types of people. And go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But they still had a hard time with this because they had this, this racist mentality that the Jews were better than everybody else. And that was not of God, but it's something that existed in their time. And I proved this when I preached through the book of Acts. You could see it over and over again. And God really had to do a lot to get through, especially to Peter, to show him these things. And Peter ends up going and preaching the gospel to Cornelius, who was an Italian, who was not a Jew. And he did it because God told him to do it. So he did it. Verse number 38 here in Acts chapter 10. He's, he's, he's preaching here now, and he says, How God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. Excuse me, anointed. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And again, we just see a reference to even Jesus himself being anointed, being baptized with the Holy Ghost, and that power Jesus was doing good. Jesus was healing people. Jesus raised the, dead, raised the dead through the power of the Holy Ghost. Because he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So obviously he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching Jesus. He's preaching his death. He's preaching his resurrection. And as he's preaching to these people, look at what happens. We're going to jump down a little bit to verse number 44. Verse number 44, While Peter yet spake these words, as he's preaching the gospel unto them, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So we see here, these people get baptized with water after they're baptized with the Holy Ghost. The first thing that happens is they believe. Then... God pours out and immerses them with the Holy Ghost. It's not connected with the water baptism. That's the whole point I'm trying to make here, is that they're two separate events that don't have anything to do with each other. The water baptism, and again, I'm going to get to that at the very end. I'm almost there. Why do we even get water water baptized? It's not to receive the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not to receive the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. It's not to get saved. It's none of those things. 
When a person gets baptized with the Holy Ghost, it's because Jesus decides to give that person power from on high to go out and do a work for Him, to go out and do things that under their own power they cannot do. In this story, these people get baptized with water after they're baptized with the Holy Ghost. They're not connected at all. Peter sees that because he's like, well, these people must obviously believe because God's poured out the Holy Ghost on them. So, hey, let's baptize them. How can we not baptize them? They're obviously saved. And that was needed for them to see that because they were still thinking that they only could go to the Jews. He needed to see that, that, that miracle of God so he could say, oh, wow, wow, we really need to be doing this. This is God's will. And he recounts this, this whole story in chapter 11. And this is so there's no doubt about this being a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, it doesn't say they were baptized with the Holy Ghost in chapter 10. It just says that they were able to speak with other tongues. Well, it's all tied together when Peter is telling everyone else back at church, hey, this is what happened. You know, and they're arguing about him going off and talking to the Gentiles. Look at verse number 15 of chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 15. Peter's telling this story back to them of everything that just happened with Cornelius. He says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's what it means. That's what it is. That's what it was. They, were, they, they received extra power. They received gifts from the Holy Ghost to do things that they weren't normally able to do. It's not because they were baptized. It didn't come as a result of them being water baptized. It was something that God, that Jesus gave them. It was a baptism that he was able to do. See, men were able to baptize people in water. John, the Baptist, was able to go and baptize people in water. And that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what we, that, and that's what we do. Jesus is the one that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Jesus was the one that was able to give that authority that of even the laying on of hands for the apostles to be able to also confer the power of the Holy Ghost onto other people. That comes from Jesus. That doesn't come from water baptism. So then why are we baptized? Why do we even do it? What's the point? Right? I can see it's a command. We need to do this. Turn if you would to Romans 6. It's the last place we go and we're done. Romans chapter 6. Last place I'll have you turn. You may never be baptized with the Holy Ghost in your lifetime. That doesn't mean you're not saved. It's a completely separate event. It's something that God can bless people with. And that's fine. God will do so as, as He sees fit. But if you're saved, you ought to be baptized. And baptism itself is a picture or a representation of what we believe. When a person gets baptized, and this is again another reason why we baptize by complete immersion, by going under the water, by being dunked under the water. Because what you are doing is you are representing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ when you get baptized. When you go down into the water and you're standing there, you're representing Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross. When you get dunked under the water... That's a representation of the burial of Jesus Christ when he, was di- when he died and was buried. And when you come back up out of the water, this is why we don't drown you, you come back up out of the water, it represents his resurrection. And he came back to life, came up from the grave. Up from the grave he arose. Praise God. And Romans 6, I'm not just making this stuff up yet, yeah, it sounds real good, but this is what the Bible's teaching, is that we're buried with him by you know through with his death by our, in our baptism, and we're going to read we will read Romans six in context. We're going to look at uh, verse number one of Romans chapter six, and we'll get a, a clear understanding of this. Romans chapter six, verse number one: What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course, because chapter five ends up saying that look, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. For those people who want to say that if you sin after you're saved, somehow you can lose your salvation, no. 
No matter how much you sin, grace covers that sin to the full, to the fullest. You can never sin more than God's grace covers. God's grace covers it all. But just because that happens, just because you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, just because your sins are covered, does that mean, hey, we should just continue in sin? Great, I'm saved. Let's go out and just sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. Of course not. That's foolishness. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? So you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That immersion, that going under the water, we're baptized with him into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So not only is a baptism the picture of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's also an event that you should be using in your life to say, hey, I'm dying to my old sinful ways, the sin that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross and that He died for, and I'm going to leave those sins behind, buried in that grave, down in the hell Jesus brought our sins to, and I'm going to walk in newness of life. I'm going to walk as a resurrection, as, as, as a resurrected Jesus Christ would walk. I'm going to walk. That's the way that I'm going to live. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm free from my sin, but I'm going to leave those sins behind and I'm going to walk in newness of life. And that's, that's another um, point of being baptized is to kind of make this turning point in your life. Look, you're already saved, but now you're going to say, Hey, I'm going to, now I'm going to live righteously. Now I'm going to do what's right. Not because I need to do that to be saved. I'm already saved. I'm going to walk in newness of life because, because of what Jesus did for me. Because I respect that, because I'm appreciative of what he did for me, because I'm so thankful that God loves me so much to give me eternal life, I'm going to walk in newness of life. I'm going to do what's right now. I'm not going to be getting carried off into sin. God forbid. Verse number five, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died... He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And it goes on and on. You can read the entire chapter. We're going to stop there. But that's why we're baptized. Baptism is important. It's a command of God. Jesus commanded people to go out and be baptized with water. That's what men can do. That's what we can do. We can baptize people in water. And we should. And it it shows our Lord's coming. It shows the resurrection. It shows our hope. And it shows that we're going to die to ourselves. We're going to die to our sins and walk in newness of life. Completely separate event from being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Completely separate from the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And has nothing to do with us being saved. It's something we do after we're saved. So hopefully there's some, you know, we'll be able to clear up if you had any doubts or any confusion about baptism. It's important to go through these, and there's there's a lot of other things we could have covered, but um, I think that the the difference between the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the the water baptism is a a very important distinction that needs to be made. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for... um, all the, the teaching that we could get, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be diligent in our Bible reading and our Bible studying, dear Lord, that we can put these passages side by side. We can put them in order. We could really see and, and look closely at what you're, you're teaching us and what 
we need to understand what in the in the proper doctrines that we need to have uh, regarding these things. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to gain more knowledge, to reach those people who are trusting in their own works, people who are trusting in baptism, people who are trusting in other things than just faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to be better soul winners, help us to know your words more and be able to explain them and show them and teach them more clearly, dear God. Pray that you please just keep these words alive in our hearts and in our minds to be able to um, to have them ready and not and not be forgetful hearers of these words, dear Lord, but doers of the work and being able to show them and, and not forget where these passages, references are when, when we do end up coming across someone that needs to hear these words, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.